And with that, we're going to um, jump right in. We have two great presenters, and this is yet another way that ADVANCE is working to bring together resources and to foster collaborations that can support faculty. So Stephanie Tafigi, who's from my office, has been working with lots of faculty, junior faculty, on um, building their portfolios, including looking at broader impacts and connecting with community. And then Monica Kowal, of course, is I'm going to get her title wrong. Director? Director of Community Engagement Initiatives. Thank yes. you. Director of Community Engagement. I didn't know if it was director or supreme goddess. I don't know. Something well, like that. If you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Office of the Vice President of Research, we have a research strategic plan. And part of that is to, again, connect with Vonica's office and try to support community-engaged scholarship and connect researchers with communities. So, this is bringing together lots of different initiatives, and um, we're really glad that you're here and that we're going to get to learn from both of these wonderful folks. So it's all yours. Take it away. Take it away. All right. Okay, so um, like Mary Jo so eloquently said, we are going to talk about engaging with communities on broader impacts. Uh, we have um, people on campus that are devoted to that, including Monica's office, and then the, commu the um, Community Engagement Center is also devoted to that. And then I'm going to um, tell you about a lot of resources that are also on campus to help with the specifics that you may find interesting in your broader impacts, as well as helping you to create your own broader impacts identity as a researcher. Um, but first, what are broader impacts? A lot of people, especially those who have applied already to the NSF, to the National Science Foundation, already know that that is a key term that comes up a lot with proposals. Um, the, the National Science Foundation is the first um, sponsor to actually require a section called Broader Impacts, but they are not the only sponsor that appreciates that or sometimes does require that. So there are times where you need to be able to show how your work can benefit society, okay? So it's often referred to as an outreach effort, um, but it's your way of contributing to a certain achievement that you want to be able to do with your research. The National Science Foundation has also determined a set of outcomes that they are interested in, though they are very explicit about saying that it doesn't have to follow one of these objectives, but they are pretty broad, and so chances are your broader impact will have some way of contributing to these objectives. Um, they typically will include um, STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math education. So it could be enhancing the education practices of certain teachers through professional development. It could be through engaging students from K through 12 or even undergrad or graduate school in a certain line of research that maybe your, is a product of your your um, proposal that you're submitting. It could be an increase in public literacy. So if you are looking at a way to enhance um, the science identity of the general public or to inform them of a new science initiative that's coming through, that is something that you can put into your broader impact. It could also be that you're increasing national security through your broader impact. Um, that is something that you can do. Or to encourage an, um, collaboration with industry. These are also pieces that fall in that a lot of times um, faculty don't think about. They typically think about K through 12 education and they're like, but I don't like working with kids. That's okay. There are a lot of different ways to be able to do a significant amount of broader impact without having to go in and work with you know, K through 12 kids or even with teachers. Again, my name is Monica Kowal and my um, office um, I'm kind of in a dual role on campus where I have the Office of Community Engaged Learning and Research, which is very much focused on students um, uh, who want to take classes that are community engaged, but also for faculty, we provide any type of resources and support to faculty who are perhaps um, involving themselves in a research agenda that requires um, or that they see as having a community component into it. And in my field, which is service learning and community engagement, we talk a lot about kind of the semantics of the different types of um, uh, outreach and community work that we do. And outreach is one facet of that. And I think from the, ter from the perspective of the National Science Foundation, they use the term outreach in the kind of the very traditional sense. It's that it's some sort of program or initiative 
or um, a research agenda that is um, orients or I guess originates itself from within the university, typically from a faculty perspective and with information, services, um, um, ideas, uh, 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 scholarly publications that are all meant to be for public consumption, right? And we, when we just talk about public consumption, we're talking about outside of the traditional, traditional university community. So faculty, staff, students that are on campus, when we talk about the public or, out, or uh, the community, we're talking about those groups that are outside. So typically, when we talk about outreach, it's very unidirectional. It's done for the public, right? I, I'm a researcher, I do my research, but how people consume it and utilize it sometimes doesn't always, uh, is not part of my, the, the uh, crux of my work. Um, that they are maybe applying existing knowledge to public problems. Again, it's a very unidirectional flow of knowledge. And it, it, um, there's a primacy of academic knowledge without really kind of engaging with community at its base format. And I think, you know, touching, Stephanie and I talked a lot about this when we were putting our presentation together. And I want to encourage you to, to understand that there is a continuum. And she's touched on this too. There's a continuum of, Am I going to um, make my broader impact statement something that is, is, is just at its base level, I'm gonna see how it, my information flows out to the um, broader public, or am I gonna really engage with the public or the, a broader community to facilitate, um, uh, create knowledge and um, kind of in a more mutually beneficial and reciprocal way. So, um, so we refer to that as engagement. So it's academic work done with the public, that it's not just a unidirectional flow of information, but you want to engage with your um, target audience, perhaps, um, to identify the research question, to identify the parameters of the outreach program. You know, if you're going to design a curriculum or something that public uh, school teachers can use, it might behoove you to actually ask the public school teachers what they need, right? Or what, where, where they see, because that, that's an existing and very important knowledge base that you want to have. So it's very um, much um, uh, a flow of knowledge creation through uh, the community and back out. So this is what my job is to do here, is to encourage you to consider this. It's not required. Um, and everybody has their flow. And I think Stephanie will touch on it a little bit more later on, is that you want to make sure your broader impacts project that you create is something that you can achieve, right? That's not, we're not saving the world here necessarily, but it has to be within the parameters of your time, your ability, your resources, all of those things. We do want to, you know, make our research um, um, impactful, but how you do that really depends on the scope of your scholarly identity and your, um, uh, the work that you're doing. Um, so, and then when we talk about benefits to society too, here's kind of some additions to the, to the broader impact statement is, is when we look back at this, this thing, this is a very large, very broad list of potential projects that you can take. Um, so when we want to break it down uh, a little bit more theoretically, is, is how do we um, uh, really kind of parse down and envision the work that we're doing as seeing as a benefit to society? What does that mean, really? Um, so community-engaged scholarship, this is something also uh, that I work on. So I work with two national organizations, which is the Engagement Scholarship Consortium and um, my research association, which has a long name that I just, we just call it IR Slice, and if you want more information. But working with faculty and also staff who do outreach about um, understanding the theoretical foundations of that reciprocal relationship. And so um, it's really scholarship that's um, focused on outward change, right? That it's community engaged, community based, that it's mutually beneficial. And that most importantly, I think what the NSF really wants to see is that how is your research agenda building capacity for societal change, right? You're not necessarily um, you know, creating the magic key that will solve all the world's ills. That's far too big of a goal. But how is it contributing to that broader societal change? And how do you envision that? And then your idea grows from that. Uh, and of course, what do we mean by community? Um, I did, you know, clarify that, you know, from our perspective, community is outside of the traditional university 
um, group. So it's it's not necessarily our scholarly community, our research community, um, you know, people who we work with, organizations, funders that we work with, but it can be a number of different things. Geographic regions is huge. The Grand Challenges universe, um, research initiative that the university has started out is really very much focusing on problems, solving problems within our state. But community can also mean a number of different areas. It can mean um, identity, right? Gender, race, other personal characteristics, shared characteristics, um, an affiliation, your circumstances, right? A lot of different um, areas within that. Your profession or practice is a community. There's faith-based communities. And of course, there's kind of familiar relationships that can also be um, perceived as universities and targets for the work that you're doing. Um, so a little bit more um, about engaged research, specifically as a creative scholarly approach to broader impacts. Um, again, it really, and I think we're going to get, I don't want to spend too much time on these slides because it'll be available to you later, but the worksheet that Stephanie has put out on the table is really that beginning of, of you thinking through these problems. And let me just stop and ask a question. How many of you in envisioning, you know, some of you might be at different stages of, of putting together an NSF proposal. How many of you feel like you have a really solid, concrete idea for broader impact statement? Okay, all right. How many of you are just like, I have absolutely no idea what they're asking for. Don't be embarrassed. This is a safe space, right? <laughs> um, so I think that's important is to understand too that everybody in this, um, and, and some of you might be in the middle. There was a lot more hands that didn't go up. So some of you might be in the middle. Um, to think about approaching it, and community engaged scholarship is really kind of a theoretical uh, approach to developing those relationships and setting that research agenda or that outreach agenda. Um, but I think I too want to um, put forward this, that um, when you think about your broader impacts, it shouldn't just be something that's like an add-on to what you're doing. Um, we like to encourage faculty uh, and researchers to think about how the broader impacts work that they're doing or their outreach work that they're doing is informed by and also simultaneously informs your teaching, research, and service agenda. It should not be something that you're doing outside of it. It should be something, I say it's like the force. It's something that flows within all of those three roles that you play. And so um, the easiest way and the way to keep your sanity when you're developing your um, proposal probably is to think how can this um, and be informed by what I'm already doing in my classroom. How can this be informed by what I'm already doing with my research agenda or my service? Is there a service um, uh, opportunity that I'm already engaged in that could be turned into a broader um, uh, project, a more long-term project, and that could be part of my proposal? So really think about how the engagement with community is not just, again, that unidirectional, but something that, um, that you see flowing through your, um, your activities. So let's see. I think that's you. It's going to be a lot of static and movement on the camera while I get that off. Thank you. All right. So um, what is the infrastructure to support broader impacts? Uh, we are, we, our offices are both very devoted to helping you to develop your broader impacts. Um, there are a lot of other groups on campus that are also um, working toward that, and there are a lot of groups outside. Um, I'm going to go into more detail about them, but just to think off the top of our heads, um, we are here right now finding out about this because of ADVANCE. ADVANCE is very devoted to it. Um, the Faculty Research Development Office, um, we are able to help to um, create those partnerships between yourself as a researcher and your um, community partners, as is Monica's office, as well as um, K through 12 community partnerships, if you've already got them or if you're looking to uh, define them. Museums, um, Anthony Silvano from Explora is here, and I'm going to talk more about the partnership that uh, we've been developing. Um, but those are other ways of uh, working with partners to be able to develop your broader impacts with the partner on the proposal side as opposed to on the out, on the um, award side saying, hey, I put you in this proposal, now I want to do this with you. Is that okay? 
Because just like Monica said, if you're developing something, if you're proposing something that is not in line with what is actually feasible or even in the goals of your um, partner, it's, it's not going to be worthwhile. It's either not going to go through because they're not going to have the resources or the time or the energy or you're not going to have that, those resources to be able to put it in or it's just not going to be um, feasible to the reviewers and it's not going to get awarded. Uh, because even though, uh, like I'm a member of the National Alliance of Broader Impacts, and we are very aware that your broader impact will, by itself, will not get you funded um, by the National Science Foundation. It has to be strong research that gets you funded. But if you have strong research and you have a poor broader impact, you still will probably not get funded. You have to have you know, them side by side in that when it comes to the National Science Foundation and any other sponsor that is requiring you to have a broader impact. So just thinking about those and making sure you understand what the, what the um, resources are. So now it's time to think about that worksheet that I sent out. Um, so Anthony and I are part of a partnership called the Broader Impacts Design Partnership. It's being led by the um, Pacific Science Center and the research is being done by the um, Oregon State, by researchers at Oregon State. Julia Risen is the, is the main um, PI on that. Julia has actually looked into what it means for PIs to create a broader impacts identity, okay? And for them to be able to use that to not only create one program, but actually to have a lifetime of contribution to science through their research. And this is the goal, you know, because like Monica said, and like we'll continue to reiterate, this is not something that you can do as a one-off. Um, that will not get you funded. Re reviewers have, um, oftentimes commented that this broader impact just doesn't, it seems to have too much effort for the amount of um, success that you're going to be able to see through this, and they won't appreciate that. They want to be able to see something that's sustainable, that is in line with your research, and is using the resources that you have available. So what can you do? Uh, this is coming from the NSF. Um, these are, they put together a broader impacts perspectives uh, working group a couple of years ago. Um, that group included Susan Renault, who is the director of the National Alliance of Broader Impacts. And they defined three methods for you to be able to um, incorporate your, broader Im your research into your broader impact. So one of it, the proposed research itself could define the broader impact. Okay, so say for instance, your research could be so beneficial to society that you presenting it in that way is enough. You know, you don't have to do an extra program to, you know, teach the public about this. You don't have to do an extra um, workshop or an extra teaching um, experience with undergraduates. Your research itself could be a benefit to society. Um, some examples that I found from the broader impacts perspective that the NSF put out were, you know, if you were studying the uh, life cycle of a natural disaster, and you are able to use that understanding to then be able to predict natural, national disasters that could possibly, you know, save homes, save lives, do these things, that's a pretty big broader impact right there, okay? It's not always going to be the case that your research is going to necessarily automatically benefit society in that way, but it could also directly contribute to the broader impact. So that's usually talking about the application of your research f as a way of benefiting society. So some of the ex examples that we have up here, um, it was the advancement of computer architecture that could extend the battery life of electronics. And so the researcher was able to say, okay, my research is this, this, and this, this. Broader impact could be better battery life. And he was able to try it out. This was actually a career proposal, the one on the, uh, on the whatever direction you're looking at left. Uh, and so with that, um, he was able to create this computer game that he was then able to bring into K through 12 environments, but he was able to test the battery life. And so that was actually one of his broader impacts. Um, on the other side, your research may be able to be complemented by the broader impacts activities. Um, the one on the right was also a career proposal and that researcher, um, the premise of the career is that you not only are creating this amazing research, but you're also educating people to be able to carry on that research after you have stopped doing it. And so that's a big component of the National 
Science Foundation career proposal. And so what this researcher did was to create ambassadors of the students in her lab to be able to go into underrepresented, um, to high schools that had underrepresented minority groups to be able to help them to see the benefits of continuing their education and going into higher education in chemistry. Um, other examples could be museum exhibits. And these are things that definitely take planning, they take working, and they take money. So it's not necessarily something that everyone is able to do to create a museum exhibit. When I was in Atlanta at the um, Georgia Institute of Technology, I helped to, to um, create a museum exhibit. And just the box itself that we put the robots into was $15,000. So, you know, I mean, this is something that you have to be able to understand up front what your limitations are, and you also have to have really good partners in the museum uh, realm to be able to help you out with that. Um, other pieces that I really like to share with faculty is the um, effective policy. So if your research could have a potential of informing policymakers about something that could go forward, this is a very broad impact that your research itself could have you might not necessarily be the person who is educating the public about it. You may not be necessarily the person who is writing the reports about it, but you are engaging with the policymakers to put it on their agenda so that they understand that your research could have a broad impact. So thinking about um, the workshop that I, the, the worksheet that I, I uh, shared with you, what is your broader impact identity? You know, thinking about what can your um, for this, it's a fingerprint. Well, what could your footprint be, you know, when it comes to benefiting society? So this is about finding your broader impacts niche. Um, I did this as a uh, active workshop with my, um, with the um, assistant professors who have joined my um, NSF career cohort. Um, I would love to be able to have you take this um, worksheet home and think about it. But I do want you to think a little bit about some of the answers that are here and I want to take a couple of minutes for you to actually actively participate in this. So just getting prepared to talk to your neighbors. <laughs> so first, how does your research naturally connect to societal needs and issues? Okay, now we've heard about elevator pitches. You are all on an elevator. France Cordova is on the other side. She's the director of the National Science Foundation, if you don't know. You want to start a conversation. You want to be able to say, you know, this is my research and this is how it's going to benefit society. Okay? You have literally two minutes to be able to think of that. Okay? Can you all think about that for a couple of minutes? Can I get some head nods? Yes. No? Okay. All right, good. Okay, so let's think about that for just a little while and then I'm going to call time and I want you to turn to the person next to you and to be able to give them a one line of this is my research, and another line of this is how it could affect, this is how it could benefit society, okay? If you're not able to get to the second one, at least think of the first one, because that should be on your mind most of the time, what your research is, okay? Yeah, let's time it. <laughs> okay, so you've had a chance to talk about your research. Um, so thinking about how it naturally contributes to society. What you could be thinking about, I lost connection. All right, that's okay. Yeah, something. All right. <laughs> so now, now we're not going to break into um, thinking about this one, but I do want you to think about it on your own, and I do want you to look at the workshop worksheet to be able to uh, write things down and to really um, ruminate on what you could possibly do. Because the next question is asking you, which societal needs and issues most connect to you and your work? So again, this is looking at the feasibility of you going into an environment and being able to engage with them actively, okay? And not only to go in there as a professor, you know, because that's, that's the hardship that a lot of professors have, is that we have a standard system of education within a higher education environment, okay? It's the professor, the students. This does not necessarily always work when it comes to broader impacts, 
Okay, and this is when it comes into really understanding what does the community need and how am I able to transfer my understanding and the research that I'm doing to be able to help both of us, to be mutually beneficial. And so that's why that question is very important. And then what societal change do you want to see as a result of your work? So that's another very interpersonal um, question for you to ask yourself. You're asking yourself, okay, what do I want to see happen and how can my research not necessarily transform the world, but how can it change it in a subtle way? This is also known as your broader impacts goal. So when Monica says your broader impact statement, I think of it as your broader impact goal. Okay, and that is in line with your broader impact identity. I will tell you right now, if you include these kinds of words besides goal and statement in a proposal, like if you say, my broader impact identity is this, your reviewers probably will not know, necessarily know what you were talking about. So don't use that language. But think about it when you are conceiving these ideas and formulating this plan. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to some examples of community engaged approaches to your outreach. And then we're gonna come back to the resources that are available. So, yes, Aaron. That's a good question. Like to be able to engage internationally. Like I say my goal will be oh, I want to train all of these females in, uh, in Africa to know how to do that. Mm. I mean that, yeah, <laughs> I mean that, that is cute. So just the way that you uh, I just have to develop it. Sometimes. No, I just have She's to wondering if it's US centric. I, I will, mm -hmm. I will say, I'm not that happy when your brother impact are not impacting your society. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that you do have to write it in a way to justify it. Um, but say, for instance, if your students are going with you to Africa to help with this, or if you are engaging some American aspect of it okay. in this, or if the people that are being affected will be able to then Probably impact. Yeah. The U.S. Mm -hmm. that's a broader impact that the that the NSF would support. Uh, but you're very right in the fact that it does have to have some kind of connection to the U.S. And the reason, you know, it, it's all about money. Like the the NSF is funded by U.S. tax dollars, um, so they want to be able to see the benefit to the U.S. Uh, but for them to be able to see that, you know, researchers from the U.S. are going to Africa to have a better understanding of what you know, is going on and what they can do to contribute, I mean, that is a broader impact right there. I would also add that part of the mandate of the National Science Foundation is to ensure that the U.S. maintains its leadership in science and technology and, and its workforce, you know, maintains the cutting edge uh, to keep the U.S. as a leader. So um, I agree with you completely that training people in other countries wouldn't ensure that for the United States. Mm -hmm. so I already have to put that in the permit, but mm -hmm. I don't know whether or not I can have that training portion of that as part of the Maybe cross training. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, with the statue, with the research now we are going to But also creating collaborations, you know, because like Carmen said, you know, increasing the U.S.'s footprint in uh, the global. STEM environment, I mean, that's, that's something that the National Science Foundation is very excited about. So if you're able to see that, you know, to be able to make the argument that you are creating collaborations for U.S. faculty and, and scientists to be able to collaborate in that environment, um, that's also a very positive piece. I do have another question regarding, because some, I mean, for me, at least, whenever I'm writing it, it's always about the space, right? You always end up with, like, how what they do, you're writing, you know, the whole broader impact plan, and sometimes I feel like I end up writing lots of like individual sentences that oh I'm gonna recruit undergraduate minorities from New Mexico, you know that's one broader impact, and this also has societal impact because I'm advancing this field, and 
and then on top of that, I'm doing this warm and then a STEM workshop. Please understand, it almost ends up like this Russian salad where I'm just having, you know, <laughs> four million ideas in like, you know, half a page. And so I wonder how you guys feel about it because you do some, you know, when I'm in panel and people don't mention, oh, the research itself is having an impact in whatever fisheries or right. uh, conservation biology. If you don't do it, the reviewers bring it up. But when you write everything, it looks terrible because you just have this amalgamation of like random ideas in one paragraph that is all crammed together. There's no cohesiveness, there's no one common theme running, you know, through. So for me, that's the biggest challenge. I think I think it goes to the question of, or to a, a task that maybe a lot of researchers need, it's an exercise for you to think about a long-term plan for those research agendas that those, all those, you know, 400 ideas that you have, which, which appeals to this particular, because NSF, and, and I'm not, I'm trying, not going to poo-poo NSF here at all, but, <laughs> or say that, that, you know, it doesn't work, but it is, it is just one example of a large funding agency that expects this type of statement and commitment to you. If they're going to fund you, they want to know how it's going to make society better. But the NSF is not the only funding agency that asks for these type of statements. There are many other funding agencies within the United States and in international areas that ask for these types of statements. So my suggestion to you would be to really look at the NSF award that you're applying for but first, before you even do and look and make sure before you even do that is go back and start to parse out all of those 400 ideas, which are immediately achievable for you now, which apply to this grant, which may apply to another grant, and then also create some sort of um, a timeline or or structure where you see them feeding upon one another. Because I think if the NSF were, were to see your broader impact statement, yes, this is how it's going to be. This is the U.S. centric portion of what I'm doing for this particular grant, but I also want to add that it's also part of a larger agenda that feeds into international collaboration and strength in developing, you know, scientific discovery in whatever area that you're going to be in. And, uh, for me, like the reason why many of us do it that way is almost the fear of putting all of the eggs in one basket. Like, you know, let's say, oh, I just write one thing, right? I'm going to yeah. write, I'm going to train, blah, 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 business plan, and then you get three reviewers that are like, this is not enough. Or, yeah. This is not a great, super original idea. Over and over again, when I'm in panels, I'm like, oh, same old, same old, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why I write three or four or five things, because at least I think I'm cool. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. That Eventually, so you're going to get something. It. Yeah. Well, if I were you, if that's kind of, you know, and it goes back to that slide. Can you go back to your last slide about with a little arrow on it? That, that, you know, and, and I think this is really a good exercise for you in, 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 in moving backwards or starting at that number three question right there is, is what's the change? And then how can I move backwards from that to kind of scaffold my research agenda up to that point? And is that point societal, you know, or uh, international um, work? And then if so, how can I target the NSF grant to make it, to make it some aspect and the first step to that number three? That would be my recommendation to you is to really kind of think about how am I going to parse this out over three years, over six years, over 10 years, over my entire career with that thing, if, with international being my goal, but realizing that I'm currently applying for a US centric grant. I think that helps, like once you get tenure and you have been doing it for a while, you can have that mentality again when you first start, you're so worried about your research, like you're falling. I mean, when I started as an assistant professor, I wouldn't have thought about this. Mm -hmm. Flesh, flesh it out a little bit. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so um, one thing, and I, I, I you know, want to kind of go back to that slide, but also to think about, you know, um, what, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Irene. Irene? Irene. Irene. Um, talking about in terms of, you know, the, us beginning as researchers, having this kind of, you know, spark of interest, what has... Uh, 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 inspired us to do the work that we do and then kind of growing from there. Um, and I, I wanted to show, but I also want to um, point out that something that Stephanie said that really kind of triggered something, when you engage with the broader community, so when you 
um, go out and put yourself out, even maybe pr prior to writing your broader impacts um, goal. When you engage with a community organization or a target community that you would like to be working with, they may offer, don't underestimate the value of community-based knowledge that you may have not considered in forming your goal. That if you were to engage with a community organization or a, a school system or whatever your target audience might be for your outreach, they may be able to inform and inspire and really kind of um, make more robust that statement in a way that you might not have considered. So I just want to point that out. Um, and, and it's you know, kind of the, the goal of the reason why I'm part of this is um, to make sure that you ask them what they need. Because we are famous, institutions are famous for saying, yes, we have all the knowledge here and we're going to bestow our wisdom on you. you know? <laughs> and um, I think it's important um, that you um, maybe just consider ways that you can come at it from a different angle. Um, so I wanted to show you, and these are not NS, I'm going to qualify this, these are not NSF funded projects, not by any means. Um, one of them is a NASA funded project. But I wanted to show you kind of three local examples. These are all uh, faculty and projects that are done here at the University of New Mexico by three um, UNM professors um, at various levels and in various disciplines of outreach projects that started just as that, but have become you know, very robust, um, sustainable, scalable, longitudinal projects, outreach projects that have grown over the course of time um, and with community input. So um, some of you might be familiar with, I'm going to move over here now so that I won't be in people's way, but um, with Jessica Goodkind, she's a professor, an associate professor in sociology. And um, she runs, and, and I also want to point, point out that these three are examples of um, very kind of uh, grassroots outreach efforts that are very localized, but that can be replicable and generalizable to a broader community, to a bunch of different areas, um, uh, and to ones that are just like massive, massively funded and massively scaled. And so I think that's another thing to think about when you're thinking about your broader impacts goal is, where do I want to start? Do I want to start big? Can I start big? Do I have the resources, the energy, the you know, sanity to start big? Um, or do I want to start small and then see where it goes? So the Refugee Wellbeing Project is um, a, I think it's been going on for about six or seven years now. Uh, it started with Jessica when I think she was at Illinois. And she, um, it's got a really robust um, outreach because it offers, you can't really see it, but um, her work was with um, uh, refugees that are resettling in particular cities and how difficult it is for refugee communities to access resources within new cities that they've just been, maybe they didn't have a choice to move to, you know, um, Cincinnati, Ohio. They were put there for a wide variety of reasons, but how do you in incorporate um, uh, um, uh, a base for them so that they understand access to education, access to physicians, access to all kinds of community resources. And the design that she has made over the years has been, she has a class, right, um, which involves graduate and undergraduate students. She has a community-based component, the learning circles, that, learning circles that she does with, it. she places graduate students with refugee families and they, um, have this facilitated discussion uh, area where they get together and they start to build community. And she also has um, an advocacy uh, component to her outreach program. And uh, she also has a very robust research agenda that comes out of this project consistently. She's always publishing with her graduate students. Um, there's, there's many, many publications that have come out of it. And it's a program that is just kind of organically and naturally grown out of her interest to work with refugee communities. So that's one example of a really robust um, but kind of a smaller scale outreach program that focuses on one local community, one geographic area, right? The second one is, of course, um, all of you probably know Melanie Moses. She's a professor in computer science. And this is a NASA-funded um, outreach program called the Swarmathon. I think they're in their last year this year um, for the funding for this. But this, you know, it's a, a very large grant. Um, it engages uh, campus uh, students from all over the country. Is it international too or just US based? US. Just US, probably if it's NASA. Um, but uh, these students, and, and I'm just gonna butcher what they do. They do something where they create little robots and, and it's massive and there's lots of money involved and they all go to 
Cape Canaveral, right, or something, and you know, do all kinds of stuff. But this is, and, and her CS for All, um, Computer Science for All Teacher Education <laughs> Program, that is another massive um, outreach program that she runs. So, you know, um, and just, and if you want to talk about somebody about, you, you know, I, I've always wanted to sit down, I haven't got a chance, is what was the nugget? <laughs> when, when were you here in this room being like, what am I going to do? And hear about her journey of how she's designed all of these outreach programs. Um, which are very successful and widely known, nationally recognized and rewarded. Um, so that's a the big kind of a big scale. And then another one, I, I don't a lot of people have not heard of this program. BEMP has been at UNM for 22 years. Um, how many of you have heard of BEMP? Yeah, not many. And it is the most inspiring outreach program that I have ever come across <laughs> in all my years, which is not many. Just, to, just saying. Um, but um, so it's the Bosky Ecosystem Monitoring Project, and it, and Kim Eichhorst is a biology. She's a research professor, um, and but she was not um, the originator. It was um, Cliff Crawford, who was a biology professor. Uh, Twenty-two years ago, there was a report that came out from. Um, uh, the, uh, it was like the Bosky Monitoring Project. It was an interagency uh, report that focused on the disappearance of the Bosky here within the central Rio Grande Valley. And um, he just thought, it, I, 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 again, he's, he's passed on, but this is a 22-year legacy. And if you get a chance next year, go to the Crawford Symposium which is here on UNM's campus, and it's millions of research, not millions, but lots of little <laughs> researchers, little kids running around um, presenting their research. And it's a citizen science program, basically. They decided, uh, Cliff thought it would be a great idea to get community members involved in citizen science data collection around the Bosky ecosystem that fuels and um, informs uh, a huge database of, of, of all kinds of environmental data um, that is used by something like 13 or 15 national agencies, local, regional, and national agencies that tap in to the BEMP data um, and use it. The Army Corps of Engineers uses it. The Department of the Interior uses it. U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, New Mexico Fish and Wildlife, uh, all kinds of environmental agencies tap into the citizen science data that these literally kindergartners they train the teachers to get the kindergartners with these little tubes and they go out and they collect poop and, and water and all kinds of stuff. And then they put it, they have it all, they enter it all into this database and then all these agencies uh, uh, tap into it for, to do their work, right? Their restorative work. And it was really interesting to, to listen to people from Department of the Interior and U.S. Fish and Wildlife come in and say, I could not do my job if it weren't for any of these little kids that collect these water samples or collect these porcupine quills or to um, you know, look at dead trees and stuff like that. It's, it's really very inspiring. So another one, a, a, a single professor who was doing work who saw an opportunity, and then it's grown into this massive outreach program. So I just wanted to offer those three, those three even though they're not NSF or STEM focused necessarily, they're really great um, uh, examples of how something that has grown and really built from that scholarly identity. And then um, a couple years ago, uh, a group of faculty, staff, um, and students from across um, Health Sciences Center and Ming Campus um, started this group that was focusing on, really they were, they realized that there was a lot of, um, a lack of kind of cross-campus collaboration, which we've all heard about, um, but uh, with Health Sciences Center, but um, uh, that really there were a lot of main campus faculty who were doing similar work to Health Sciences faculty, but didn't, they didn't know each other. They were even working in the same regions in the same areas on same types of project, maybe from different um, disciplinary backgrounds. So they formed this um, co uh, community of practice essentially called the Hive, which I loved because I'm a beekeeper, so that was perfect for me. Um, but health inclusion, vibrancy, and equity, and it really um, focuses on social determinants of health and how to, to address social determinants from health from across, uh, from an interdisciplinary perspective. Um, and so if you're interested, you know, we've got uh, Michael Pride is one of the leads on this. She's in the School of Architecture and Planning. Um, uh, Art Kaufman and the Office of Community Health and Kieran Katira has taken over the leadership of this group. They meet monthly 
And um, so one of the just examples of a community informed project that they're doing is, of, uh, it was at the beginning of, of this last semester or the year before, I can't remember, the city of Albuquerque De Department of Behavioral Health came and did a presentation to the Hive and said, you know, we have, here, we're trying to work on all these projects and of course community partners will come to you and they will have a list of things that they wanna work with, right? Um, like here's all my issues and a lot of them come in and say, I don't know what to do. Some of them come in with very specific ideas, but um, he came in and he said, you know, one of our problems is um, public restrooms. Albuquerque is one of those cities that just does not have the infrastructure to provide public restrooms, which creates a public health hazard because people are you know, forced to go to the bathroom. If you're um, uh, homeless, they, you, you go to the bathroom where you can. Um, and so, um, and they tried all kinds of things and they you know, uh, were trying to figure out a solution to this problem and um, I was in the meeting and I said, this is a perfect example of an opportunity where you all can cross collaborate on something, on a solution to a very well defined problem. This is my uh, emphasis to you again, is that if you don't have a really clear idea of how, um, of you know, kind of externalizing and, and defining the broader societal impact of your research, talking to community might give you that spark of where you wanna go with this. And so this is a new um, partnership that I think is extended to, you know, uh, across campus um, to deal with a lot of other issues with the homeless. But this is just one example of something that grew very organically out of an interdisciplinary collaboration. And I don't know if NSF, in your broader impact statement, they want it to be very individual, don't they? They don't want it to be a collaboration? No, um, no. Uh, Not necessarily? Yeah, no, the only one that they want it to be led by the CI the career, okay. So, you know, that's, that's an opportunity there is to see what, what your colleagues in different disciplines might be working on. It may strengthen that statement for you. All right, so then we're gonna talk about um, reaching that broader impact goal. And this is the last switch. <laughs> um, so thinking about reaching that broader impacts goal, um, so this is another piece of the workshop, worksheet, well, I don't know why I keep calling it workshop, worksheet that I passed out that has to do with you actually cataloging the resources that you already have available for you to meet your goal, okay? So it asks you to really just think about, okay, well, who do I know? Who am I already working with? What resources do they have? What resources do I have? How is it going to work together to be able to meet that? Um, because it's, I think that Monica did mention that, you know, even before you're developing your broader impacts, like going out and meeting with those partners, definitely do that. I have seen more um, NSF careers be awarded to people who already had the partnerships in place. They already had, you know, the, the year of working with them at least, you know, to be able to say, hey, I have been working with this, you know, school, I have been working with this partner, I have been working with this museum, I've been working with this, um, you know, national lab, if you're going to be doing something with them. And this is what, what the, this is the problem that we have seen that needs to be addressed. And we're going to address it like this, you know, being able to have that experience. After you've thought about what you already have, then you need to think about what do I need? You know, what is missing here and where can I find that to be able to, you know, reach my goal? So some things that we're going to talk about are tools that are available either on campus, throughout campus, um, connected to campus in some way, or even resources that might be visible um, by making partnerships with people outside. So some online tools that are already available. Um, this is a screenshot from uh, our webpage. So um, the research development office, we have um, frdo.unm.edu. And if you go to the tab marked broader impacts, um, you can be able to get access to a lot of online resources, including the NSF perspectives on broader impacts, where I um, was able to get the examples of the different types of broader impacts that you can have. Um, the broader impacts, um, national, the National Alliance on Broader Impacts, they're the national organization. That organization came from the National Science Foundation. It was a proposal that was awarded to Susan Renault, who is a professor at the University of Missouri. And that is now, um, escalated to a center. And so it's called, uh, ACES is coming to my mind, but I can't remember if that's what it is or if I'm just thinking of something else. But it is a center that is actually being funded now by the National Science Foundation, also being led 
by Susan Renault, and it's looking specifically at the impact that research can have on society. And so the National Science Foundation uses the research, research that they are doing to be able to do better effect, better um, reviews, and to be able to choose um, more comprehensive programs to be able to fund. Um, and then the broader impacts um, for us, that's just the web page, the um, frdo.unm, that's the screenshot there. Um, you also have access to all of these um, examples. So anytime that I find something new that may have to do with broader impacts, I usually put it on our website. If I don't put it on our website, it's because it's already included in one of those websites. So um, if you go to the New Mexico STEM connection, you can get a, like if you access that, you can get a database of different programs that are going on at least when it was created. We have a problem with that, with updating. But you can at least get an idea of some of the programs that are already going on. Um, but you can see that UNM also has outreach organizations. Those organizations, I'm gonna go into more detail about a lot of them because they're specifically geared to the recruitment and retention of certain underrepresented groups. And that's a very powerful tool to be able to use when your broader impact is to increase the number of a certain underrepresented group in your science field you know, or in your research field. Because you as an independent person may not be as effective at recruiting as an organization that already does that. And these organizations are very excited about sharing your research with the public to use that as a way of recruiting students to come to your lab. So they're a really great partner to be able to have. Um, there are a lot of different examples. I've got Albuquerque Museums up there. I've got Girls in STEM because that's um, something that has a specific point. Industries in New Mexico, all of the industries that are up there, they have a certain outreach perspective, um, whether it be at their Albuquerque offices or at their national offices. But these are groups that have already identified that they want to be able to help more people get aware of the research that is being done in the fields that are important to them. So these are handy things to have. Um, campus resources, um, you may want to work with people who already are invested in K through 12, um, people who are already invested in undergraduate education, and people who are already invested in underrepresented um, and minority group um, outreach. If you ever have any question about who these people are or how to get in touch with them, um, contacting the research development um, specialist or the um, FRSO as, as we commonly say in um, the University of New Mexico is a really great place to start. So if you go to the link, um, you'll be able to go to a request page there for support. And so um, you can get support for your broader impacts or for your proposal in general if you go to that. Um, the K through 12 specialists that are on campus that I commonly um, send people toward is the um, STEM H Center, which Karen Kinsman is a very um, active um, advocate for um, including K through 12 experiences in STEM um, across the Albuquerque area. She's also very active in the STEM and M ecosystem that I'll talk about a little at the end. MESA. So the MESA program is also a national organization and the New Mexico MESA has got an, a, a representative that is here on campus. And that organization is working specifically with high school students to engage in higher level um, STEM experiences. So it could be that they are participating in contests, that they are creating um, projects, different pieces like that. And you partnering with them could be a way of sharing the piece of research that you are proposing. Um, the Engineering Student Success Center is also very active in recruiting and um, creating experiences. And we have, um, <laughs> we have Elsa here. Elsa, it's so nice to meet you. I've, I've emailed you a lot. I, there you go. This is Elsa. I usually don't get the time to go, but as a matter of fact, we have a, I wanted to invite, tomorrow we have energy day, if anybody wants to come to work, it's funded by the Department of Energy. And the students are gonna, or students actually are recording this very new, where over 100 kids are coming to campus. That's awesome. They'll do energy related experiments. I, I, will, I will be checking you out. That is awesome. Yes, actually, this is the Engineering Center from 9.30 to 2.30. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
have we have rotation of experiments all related to they are building windmills, they are doing solar cars, uh, future cars, and the, uh, the leaders are actually are engineering students. Oh, I think I saw the car. Yeah, I saw the car already there. Carmen, did you have something to add? Because I wanted to point to the Maxwell Museum because it also <laughs> reminded me that sometimes it's not so easy to get off campus and you know go to the actual school setting. The Maxwell Museum has a busing program that's funded by private uh, donors that brings students very regularly. You've probably seen them running around campus. So the busing system's already paid for. They start at Maxwell. And, uh, and then, you know, if you're interested in, in perhaps taking them to your lab or doing some other kind of educational program with them, they're already on campus. And Amy Gochowski at the Maxwell Museum is um, in charge of that program. So ready-made students already on campus, plus the middle school students that they were able to bring. Nice. Uh, we also have a lot of under, undergraduate specialists on campus. So a lot of times people will um, propose to have research experiences for undergrads. And maybe they don't know what that means exactly. There are three active REU sites here on campus already. The nano site actually is no longer funded by the NSF, but it still continues to recruit and to be able to include um, undergraduates in their research experience for undergrads. So somehow they've, they've created that sustainability. Um, the biology one is based in the Sevieta. And then the physics astronomy is um, led by Richard Rand. It is on a hiatus right now while the PAIS is being um, redeveloped. But they will still know how to recruit and how to educate undergraduates. Um, the Student Support Services and the STEM Collaborative Center and STEM University are also very um, devoted to that. And then we also have the Engineering Students um, Success Center again. Underrepresented and minority groups is something that the University of New Mexico will always shine at. Uh, we have just recently become a minority institute, which means that more than 50% of our total enrollment identifies themselves as being from an ethnic minority group. Uh, that puts us into a category of one of two Research One universities that is also a minority institution. So Florida International is the other one. They just became our one university. They may not last. We may be the only one soon. You never know. <laughs> it's competitive. Um, and I check this. So, it's <laughs> But the fact is that we do have a large population of Hispanic students, of Native American students, um, African American students, and um, Native Hawaiian students. We actually have a little bit. 0% is showing up. But we do have you know, a couple. Uh, but these are groups on campus specifically with the student support services that, again, their objective is to recruit and retain students from underrepresented groups. And so these are the uh, websites that will help take you there. The McNair program is a uh, program for students to be able to actively engage in research. Um, so that's a really great opportunity to fall into. The Project for New Mexico um, Graduates of Color is a student-based organization. And so that one is really great if you want to be able to work um, directly with graduate and undergraduate students that are, are active in this. Um, and then the Native Americans in STEM, that's also a program that's in the Engineering Student Support Services. Um, I'm going to end by talking about a partnership that Anthony Silvano and I have just recently um, been um, added to, which is called the Broader Impacts Design Program. And so it's being led through the National, um, it's being paid for by the National Science Foundation, being led through the Pacific Science Center. And what they are doing is they're actually studying partnerships between institutes of higher education and informal STEM organizations. And so I'm the representative from UNM. Anthony is the representative from um, Explora. And we've been able to see that, you know, before we started this partnership, we had a disjointed partnership in place with him, with, with Explora and the University of New Mexico. Um, we had something called the STEM and M ecosystem, which I also include up there. Um, that's an organization that was founded as a result of the University of New Mexico, um, the STEM Collaborative Center. Uh, Mary Jo Daniel from the Research Development Office, um, Karen Kinsman from the STEM H Connections. They were um, some of the leaders that defined the STEM and M ecosystem, but it is something that is led through um, Explora and includes partners from all across New Mexico, from central New Mexico specifically, but it's beginning to increase to include partners from other parts of New Mexico as well. It's an organization that the leadership group, uh, we meet once a month. 
And then the um, other collaborators meet quarterly to be able to look at, okay, how can we better partner with each other? How, what initiatives are we trying to get to? And how can we make that work? And so this is, um, these are two different uh, groups that are all based in Explora. And so we're just working to be able to um, introduce faculty to the possibilities that they have and how to um, better support positive uh, developments between both the University of New Mexico and the researchers and the Explorer Science Center. So those are the things that we're looking at. Are there any questions? Because now we're done. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. yeah. So I have a question um, based on some of your experience of trying to explain how my research directly One year I put it in under the um, under the, um, the main science portion, mm -hmm. and they said, "Well, this is a pure math program; it's too applied." And the next year I put it under the broader impacts, and they said, "Well, we couldn't really look at the physics we were doing because it was under broader impacts; so we couldn't really we were really allowed to evaluate it." Um, cool. now, I, I mean, in, in pure math, the money is really tight. A typical grant will have a total cost of like seventy thousand. So it's always a bind. If you spend anything on broader impacts, they say it doesn't grow on trees. If you don't spend it, they say you're not serious about it. So, with, so I'm wondering, so is it best to then like mention it twice? Do I have to waste time? I say, here it is under, and then say, my broader impact is C-section. I mean, so what's the best way of handling what is a direct, you're saying this portion of your research does have a broader impact. I, I, would, I would encourage you to say it twice. Um, so I, we just had that conversation actually in the career cohort this, this uh, Wednesday, talking about the broader impact versus the education plan. Because the education plan is a requirement of the NSF career, not necessarily in anything else, but you also have to have a broader impact section. And so we were talking about how you know, the, the education plan is where you should detail out what your education plan is, and the broader impact is where you should summarize it. So like you should put you know, the details of you know, what your research is, how it will be impactful to you know, who you're trying to impact in the research piece of it, but then in the broader impacts piece of it, remind the reviewer. Say, you know, like, as we talked about in section 2.2, this research will have a significant impact on da 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 So yeah, squeeze it in. Are you applying to the NSF? Is that are those the reviews you're getting from them? Yeah, I yeah, I was successful the seventh time. There you go. Um, Seventh's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, now I have to uh, renew it, and it's, you know, and I can no longer do the broader impacts I had said I would do because my health went down. So, so you know, I put bigger restrictions, and so I'm having to rethink that. But I'm just remembering all the six that were shot down. You know, where, where I didn't do anything. They said you don't have to do all the broader impacts. You don't have to. You don't have to do. You know, increasing more participation in, in, in education. You know, didn't put that in. Like, oh, you should. You know. Every every math proposal has to have that. You know. Have you been on an NSF review panel? No. That's what I encourage any PI to do, just so that they can get the you know, yeah. the real time exposure to what that review process is like. Um, so one of the career cohort um, members is from math, and he just recently was in a review panel. And when he came back, he said, okay, broader impacts doesn't matter. Education plan matters. Mm -hmm. So you know that was his perspective from being on that review panel, and it seems to uh, mirror what you're saying, that you know, now they're saying that you have to have that education piece in there. Um, I know that a couple, uh, like, three or four years ago, I can't remember when Anna Skripka got her career, um, but her proposal did not include much of a broader impact and she got it. So I think that things have also changed a little bit um, in terms of, hey, we really do need to be educating people in what math is, even if it's basic math. So yeah, if you need somebody to, re to read through it, again, um, our office is, is very um, excited about helping anybody with that. So, are there any more? You guys are ready? Go conquer the world? <laughs> okay. All right. 
Thank you so much for coming.